I've spent the last week with the Lenovo Flex 5. During that time, I've discovered a number of things folks looking to buy the Flex 5 should be aware of before purchasing. Before we dive into things, make sure to get subscribed if you want to see more content from me. I'm planning on reviewing more laptops in the near future, so if the Flex 5 doesn't fit the bill for you, let me know in the comments what you're interested in. I read pretty much every comment posted on the channel, so don't worry about it getting lost. If you'd rather talk to me directly, there's a Discord invite in the description for the channel Discord server. With that, let's start this review. So in the box, you'll find a Lenovo Digital Pen, which is a $32 pen. It comes with a pen holder that slots into the USB Type-A port on the side of the laptop. And the pen works pretty great. Considering that it came with a Flex 5, I really can't complain too much about it. Also found in the box is a 65 watt Lenovo USB-C charger, similar to the ones provided with ThinkPads. The Flex 5 has an all plastic build. The lid is pretty smooth and it's a pretty premium feeling plastic and the plastic is the same one that's used on the bottom cover. On the back there's a big open vent which allows for plenty of airflow for cooling down the processor. The keyboard deck has a grippy plastic finish. It feels cheaper than the outside plastic but it provides for some grip when using it in tablet mode. Along the sides there's dual 2 watt upward facing speakers that sound really good. There's a fingerprint sensor on the lower right that is great, very responsive. I never really had any issues signing into Windows with it. The touchpad is a precision touchpad. It's very smooth. Even though it's not a glass touchpad, it's pretty great. Using the keyboard, it felt about right for the price point. Honestly, I'd prefer it over the XPS 13's keyboard, but it's clearly not as great as the typing experience on, let's say, a ThinkPad. The screen is rated at 250 nits, and the screen specifications are pretty much better than any other competitor's offerings at this price point, such as the Acer Swift 3 or the Inspiron 7405 2-in-1. Both of those machines have screens that are a lot worse and offer a lot less for the price than what you get here on the Flex 5. We'll touch on that more later. And now onto the ports. I'd advise you don't skip this section as there are a number of things that Lenovo says you can't do that you actually can with the ports on this machine and I'll be going over them now. There are two type A USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports on the right side of the device. There's also a full size Realtek PCIe SD card reader that's very quick. I was able to pretty much max out my 90 megabyte per second read, 60 megabyte per second write SD card and it's pretty close to my USB 3.0 external reader that I use all the time. SD cards inserted into the SD card reader stick out about halfway so you won't be able to use it for additional storage if that's what you were intending to do. There's a 3. 0.5 millimeter combo jack on the side capable of doing mic and headset. The USB-C port doesn't do display port alt mode, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, and if you weren't, now you are, but it can do USB 3.1 Gen 1 and charging. Lenovo says that you can only charge with this port, but that's not true as I've transferred data through that port using a USB-C dongle. As noted in one of my other videos, with an adapter you could use a Type A to HDMI adapter to have two display outs from this machine, not just the internal HDMI port. And speaking of the internal HDMI port, that HDMI port is capable of doing 4K 60fps despite specifications saying that it can only do 24. I was able to test this on my family's 4K LG TV which can do 4K 60 in via the HDMI port. Plugging that in via a high speed HDMI cable yielded an obvious 60fps experience and if you want to see that in action you can check out the link in the description for my testing of that. It's a very brief video just showing it's working. Now let's take a look inside of this laptop. Things are pretty tightly packed there's not a lot of empty room in this machine, which was pretty surprising to me when I opened. Most budget machines tend to have a lot of empty room, so this was a nice first impression. The SSD is a socketed SSD. It's an M.2 NVMe SSD, specifically a 2242 one from Hynix. It's upgradable to a 2280 SSD if you're interested, such as a Sabrent Rocket. I have Amazon links in the description to some SSDs I'll recommend, and any purchases made through those links will support the channel with a small cut of whatever you pay for the SSD. There's a Realtek 8822CE Wi-Fi card, which is not Wi-Fi 6 capable, but easily upgradable. And you'd be able to swap it out with an Intel AX200, which is Wi-Fi 6 capable if needed. You can pick one up for $15 off eBay, or you can spend the extra on Amazon. I'd suggest you buy one off eBay for 15 bucks. They can be had on Amazon for closer to 20 to $25 more often, but it's a bit of a ripoff. Uh, however, if you're just looking to support my channel and my content, then feel free to buy it off Amazon with my link in the description. I'd still discourage you from doing so because it's just a waste of money. But if you're looking to just do that to help the channel out, then, then feel free to do so. Moving on, there's the 52 watt hour battery, which fills up the whole bottom of the laptop surprisingly, not leaving any room for any additional expansion or anything like you'd see on other budget machines. Moving on to specifically the cooler, it's a beefy dual pipe cooler with four mounting points. 
Often budget machines or just poorly designed hardware will have three mounting points, which results in less pressure being put on the processor and can result in poor thermal performance. Luckily, since this has four mounting points, we don't have to worry about that. This cooler is also pretty great, capable of sustaining up to 35 watts under load at the low 90s without even needing a repaste. Uh, there is a large gap between the fan and the cooler grill, and you could possibly improve temp somewhat by improving the seal by like taping off the hole or just trying to seal it up a little better between the fan and thin array. The I.O. on the right side of the laptop is a modular board, so in case you manage to break one of the USB ports or the SD card slot stops working, or even the power button stops responding, you should be able to easily replace that board. Now we can see the hinge mounting points here, on the left and right side are pretty much on top of some internal components. While this is good for just mounting structural integrity, this puts the internals of the laptop at somewhat risk. So if the laptop ever falls onto its screen while it's open and there's some kind of pressure that pushes inward towards the internals of the laptop, the motherboard could get damaged and your system could just pretty much break as a result. So just be sure to be careful with this machine as it's not designed to be the most durable thing in the world. Taking a look at the inside of the lid, this is a photo from the hardware maintenance manual. You can see that there's not much for uh, load balancing arms, which you can see, I'll show, this is the T480's internal lid design. You can see those bars going up the side. Those help distribute the load on the hinges across the whole height of the lid so that you don't have to worry about the hinges breaking out of the lid or anything. Yogas have a little bit of a history of hinge failure. Uh, due to poor hinge mounting inside of the lid that can result in pretty much the screen breaking on yogas often after the warranty period is over so just watch for any sort of deterioration of your hinge and make sure to get in contact with lenovo for them to replace your lid or hinge or whatever if it starts to go bad however there's no evidence at the moment suggesting that the flex 5 will have a similar fate to these yogas so i wouldn't worry about it too much and it probably won't happen within the first year or so of ownership it's something to keep in mind though Overall, the Flex 5 is pretty great. Using it for YouTube, browsing the web, watching TV shows, and other casual tasks yields a rather pleasant, snappy experience. Despite the screen's low brightness, it was never too difficult to see inside. However, in sunnier spots, or even outdoors, the screen will likely be too dim for viewing. Moving on, DPC latency is very low on this machine when all power saving measures are turned off. This means you can expect a stutterless, smooth video viewing experience on the Flex 5 without audio pops or distortions. Do keep in mind that I've heard reports of stuttering and pops on the Flex 5 from folks in the comments. If you're running into that, I'd recommend reinstalling a stock version of Windows and manually installing the drivers to see if that helps. Let me know in the comments if you do run into this issue on your own, as I want to try and narrow down what the cause is. Game performance is incredible for how small the device is, let alone how cheap it is. Minecraft 1.15 without Optifine was running above 100 FPS consistently at very high graphics settings, even with even more FPS possible with Optifine installed. Grand Theft Auto 5 was plenty playable with the built-in keyboard and external mouse, averaging at 60 FPS during my testing at 50% frame scaling in the lowest possible settings. The Sims 4 ran great too, averaging around 100 FPS across the board at medium settings, dipping into the 80s to mid 90s in more intensive environments. Fortnite, however, is a bit of a mixed bag. At the lowest settings possible, I was only getting an average of about 53 FPS, dipping down to the 30s and the 1% lows and 20s and the 0.1% lows. Updating the drivers to Adrenaline 2020 drivers did resolve many of the visual glitches I had during my original round of testing, but the performance didn't improve at all. If you're looking to play Fortnite, you might want to get the 4700U version of this machine as it'll have much better graphics performance compared to this one. I'll go more into detail on that later. Performance on battery has a pretty big problem, and that problem is how Lenovo's power management works. Whenever the skin temperature sensor on this laptop reaches 47 degrees Celsius, the processor acts like it's overheating and things lock up for a moment or two. This results in pretty poor performance on battery and a lot of stuttering on the system. I reached out to Lenovo and they told me they're investigating, so I'll let you know when I hear back for them in an update in the description or comments. Sticking with intelligent cooling while gaming on battery might be the best for a snappy, consistent experience. However, I have had some luck with extreme performance, just lowering down the settings and locking things at 60. That does tend to prevent the stuttering I mentioned earlier. However, performance on AC power is really good. The cooler inside the Flex 5 can sustain 35 watts, which is especially great for the Ryzen 5 4500U that it has. As most machines around this price point can only handle 15 watts, or less than half the power draw 
on their coolers. This puts the Flex 5 with the Ryzen 5 4500U well ahead of its competition, even with a better Ryzen processor. Outside of the extreme performance profile, this device still dishes out some competitive performance, sustaining 25 watts with ease. While collecting benchmark data for notebook check, the Cinebench R20 multi-core score at 35 watts ended up being 5% better than the 8-core Ryzen 4700U Acer Swift 3 score at 15 watts. Keep in mind this was during a boost period of likely 25 watts on the Acer Swift 3, and it would not even be close to the maintained performance of the Flex 5. Now, benchmarking the Flex 5 with a 4700U would likely yield a much larger margin against the Swift 3, but at this time I can't test for that. I'm likely getting my hands on one soon, however, so be sure to get subscribed if you want to see me test the Flex 5 with that processor. Graphics performance is where the 4500U version of the Flex 5 falls short. While the Swift 3 scores 3,134 points on 3 Mark's Fire Strike benchmark, the Flex 5 scores only 2,828 points, or about 10% worse. In Time Spy, the Flex 5 scores 841 points in graphics, whereas the Swift 3 scored 973 points, 14% worse than the Acer Swift. If you're looking to game, picking up the 4700U variant from Costco might be the best bet. While the Swift 3 is getting better graphics performance, the CPU will be seriously limited by the low thermal capacity of its single pipe cooler. You're much more likely to have a good, consistent gaming experience on the 4700U Flex 5 as a result. Overall, my experience with the Flex 5 has been pretty good. At $600, I was expecting things to be a lot worse, but this 2-in-1 has ended up being one of my favorite laptops. The battery life you get out of this thing is really impressive to say the least. At low screen brightness, airplane mode, and all the power saving features turned on, the Flex 5 was only consuming on average 3.3 watts at the battery. That is really low. The max possible battery life you could see on this machine would be around 16 hours. In a more reasonable idle scenario, moderate brightness, intelligent cooling, and better battery set in Windows, the system was only consuming around 3.7 watts, putting the estimate closer to 14 hours. Streaming 1080p 60fps content off YouTube is one of the most realistic, low-intensity tasks I could see everyday users performing on this laptop. While testing that, the system was averaging power draw around 6.8 watts, pushing the battery life estimate at around 7 hours, give or take. Keep in mind that this estimate is from 100% to 0%, so it's likely you'll see an hour or so less if you consider 15% to be out of battery. There is one potential issue with this laptop, specifically the one key battery feature. When this feature is enabled, it's possible for your laptop to accidentally turn on and stay on while in your bag. I'd recommend turning it off. If you'd like to see how, I have a card up on the right showing you how to do that, or just use the link in the description for my early findings video. Overall, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about the Flex 5 at the moment. Keep in mind that I've only spent a week with the device, so I can't say for sure if there'll be any nasty issues further down the road. However, if you can get around the poor hinge to design and don't mind the buggy thermal throttling behavior on battery at the moment, the Flex 5 is just about the best laptop you can get for $600 at this time. If you're looking to buy a Flex 5 and want to support the channel, I'd strongly encourage you to use the Amazon links in the description. I earn a small percentage for anything you buy through those links without you even having to pay a dime extra. While it's absolutely not necessary to use my links, it goes a long way toward funding future reviews and content on the channel. Plus, you'll get my gratitude, and who doesn't want that? Be sure to get subscribed if you want to see more on the Flex 5, as I've got a lot more content planned for the future. I've set up a Discord server for the channel that you should totally join, and the link is in the description for that. Otherwise, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching, and I hope this was helpful.